Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the breaking news, Iran's attack on Israel. The war in the Middle East escalates. Our guest for this show is Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. Good morning, Rupmati. Morning, Jay. And uh, yes, uh, being a, a pleasure being on your show again. But to discuss this breaking news is... Uh, just an adrenaline rush because what we spoke about last week that the great empire has become really a rogue state. It has deteriorated to such a low point that, you know, we are uh, we are giving this program today. And Jay, let's talk about it uh, straight and direct from the heart, Jay. Okay, so the first question is, what happened? What's the news about this attack by Iran? Jay, so now you see, uh, we take into consideration the proximity of Iran to Israel and the size of the countries. And then we we uh, take the fact that Iran has uh, fired more than 120 ballistic missiles. Now, these are not simple missiles which will take hours to travel. They are uh, ballistic missiles which will take minutes to travel and create maximum damage. So uh, the estimate was that 400 Missiles, 120 ballistic missiles. So now, Jay, see this, see the venom that uh, Iran uh, exudes when they uh, send these ballistic missiles. But on the other hand, we have to consider the preparedness that uh, Israel has for uh, this attack. They knew it was coming. So uh, the estimate is that Iran has targeted 100 million Israeli civilians in this attack itself. But the casualties are just uh, injuries to two, one while running and one uh, anxiety attack. So the entire country is under bunkers to uh, face such an attack. And Iran uh, has uh, swiftly said that uh, they did not, uh, they, they intimidated the US and Russia about this attack, which uh, the White House, uh, refuted immediately and Jay, the Russian Prime Minister was in Iran a few days back. So it's a gift back to Iran, uh, the support for the Shahid drones that they have been supplying for the Ukraine war. So it's a um, nice, uh, they have created a camera array which is um, dangerous for this um, war Jay. And so you have Germany immediately uh, sending out message that they condemn the attack. UK uh, condemning. Jordan was involved um, directly in this by uh, uh, in but what do you say? They were Jordan was intercepting these missiles. It was physically involved in it, and the US through warships also intercepted these Iranian missiles. Joe Biden gave an immediate um, uh, warning that they should stop these, uh, bring down the Iranian missiles immediately. Kamala Harris and Joe Biden were in the room from where they uh, give the directions to the force. So, Jay, it was uh, swift, but it was targeted to be very uh, brutal, which did not happen, luckily. Now, the IDF faces... And Iran also put in that this was a retaliatory action against the killing of Nasrullah and uh, Nasrullah in Lebanon. So they have said that this is a one-off and it's going to stop here. And they will take further action only if Israel retaliates. So they want to try to put a stop to this because this is their second attempt, which has failed miserably. What do you think the real reason is for their attack on Israel today? Jay, they are in a fix there. They have an ego problem because none of their attacks are succeeding. And this war of uh, uh, retaliation, this axis of evil that Iran dominates and leads its proxies. Now, Israel is um, defeating its proxies in Lebanon, in uh, Gaza, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, everybody, the Yemen Houthis. There was a ground invasion of Lebanon which was going to start today. So the proxies are being targeted. But the leader is getting weaker. So it had to come into this attack. It was but evident that it was going to get pulled into this. Because without its proxies, Iran has nothingness in this uh, geopolitical um, system, Jay. It acts 
uh, evil or it spreads terror through its proxies. That's its only contribution. And when Israel is successfully dealing with these proxies, Israel, uh, Iran had to come in direct and ego clashes Jay, with uh, Hezbollah, with uh, Nasrallah. There was an uh, Iran uh, guard, revolutionary guard commander who was killed within in the bunker. Now, you know, they, were, they used the bunker uh, cluster bomb to get through several levels of concrete to get to Nasrullah. So uh, Israel has to dig deep to combat this uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. Like we have spoken about, they have always used asymmetrical methods of warfare. They have used guerrilla tactics, they have used the tunnels, they have used the bunkers. And um, to counter Israeli um, offense or, you know, uh, combat. So uh, you have to understand that Israel has to really make an effort if they want to eliminate. And if you look at uh, uh, the power stru stru structure of Hezbollah, is, uh, Israel has been able to eliminate each and every leader. They're stuck, Jay. They have lost leadership at all levels. So such a massive blow. And uh, Iran could not stand quiet. They had to come in. And uh, they gave a statement that they have attacked the Mossad headquarters. So in the morning, there was a statement by the previous president, Ahmadinejad, saying that the head of the uh, Iranian intelligence Commi uh, committee was a member or, or a supporter of Mossad. So all these things were just adding up to the tension and uh, they just attacked about this because Basically, Jay, just the ego problem. You know, Rupmati, uh, the first thing was the, the pager attack. Um, that was uh, that was apparently, looking back, a way to soften the uh, Hezbollah target uh, and to dis disrupt their you know command control communications. So that was a good idea. The second thing was uh, these bombs that Israel dropped on. Hezbollah targets in Lebanon, and uh, that killed Nasrallah. That was a good thing. The third thing was a ground a ground invasion. Uh, first, where um, you know the the special special forces uh, were going to or did enter Lebanon, and the third thing, the fourth thing, I guess, was that uh, Israel, the Israeli army, the IDF, was was going to uh, enter. Lebanon. How, how far have they gotten? I mean, I think the special forces have, in fact, entered Lebanon. Has the IDF entered Lebanon? Yes, Jay. There was uh, there was a, uh, a clip about uh, the IDF tanks in action in Lebanon. So there, the ground force attack is on. But this was Iranian attack on Israeli civilians, on the cities of Israel, and Jay to put an entire city into bunkers is such a difficult task if you imagine can you imagine going out into our city and nobody there like if you want to protect an entire city an entire country it's such a task and jay to mention that israel is fighting on seven fronts for an entire year so there is exhaustion there is uh, but the morale remains high and that's why they could have they could do this the anticipation, you know, it's such a uh, precise anticipation of uh, tactic of Israel to be able to protect entire cities and civilians. 100 million civilians were, uh, were targeted by these missiles. So imagine the scope of the ballistic missiles that they have spread. It's not one target. It's multiple targets at the same time. But once again, they have failed to, uh, the Iron Dome has worked. Uh, Jordan has helped. Um, so all these factors have thwarted the second uh, attempt of Iran to attack Israel on a larger front, on a uh, big uh, big front. And uh, Jay Pes uh, Peskeskian has said that uh, this is uh, for Lebanon. So they give these... Uh, uh, um, Khomeini has said that the worn-out Zionist regime is being um, targeted. So what is this? Uh, worn out. Uh, he is 85 years old, but he's talking about destroying Israel as a country. So you cannot use, you, you see, it doesn't matter for them where they are. They want to just destroy Israel. 
it is their definition of uh, aim and objective is very clear they want to mm. just destroy israel and they uh, it's not that they are just saying it they are making efforts what if these and they are being helped by russia and china behind the scenes uh, most definitely um so they are going all out if they had a nuclear weapon and now now the fear is that it is a head on watch kazeskin was at the united nations uh, talking yes. about peace talking about no retaliation uh, talking about achieving peace and and um, while he was doing that this is interesting while he was doing that clearly uh, iran was preparing the second attack because a second like attack like this you know it takes a little time to prepare so he lied at the united nations and the united nations um, you know was they played the united nations they played the western world um, by having Pazeski make these remarks at the United Nations. Can we trust him? They absolutely not. Uh, the, even the statement was issued by the Iranian mission to the United Nations uh, about the attack on Israel. Where is the condemnation by uh, the United Nations? You know, when Netanyahu comes for a speech, you have people and countries walking out. When Pazeski comes in and makes a, a peace, uh, peaceful uh, speech, you watch it and you believe it no like you said he's been preparing the attack all along this kind of attack of 100 plus ballistic missiles and 400 missiles itself is a big thing to prepare there is a lot of uh, um, behind the scene logistical prepare logistics preparing going on preparation going on behind this so jay how can the international community function with such suspicion and such underhand dealings that take place so a couple of days before if the Russian prime minister visits and Iran gets the, um, what do you say, the build, this boost to go ahead for this attack, now they have to wait for the retaliation, right? And the retaliation can't be uh, peck and back. It has to be a very decisive one by Israel this time. Because now uh, Israel has got a very valid reason of self-defense when, if suppose there were no bunkers, if Israel was not alert, if Israel had not anticipated, 100 million civilians would have been dead. Our headlines would have run very differently, Jay. Today we are just talking of the Iran ballistic missile attack, but it would have read civilians uh, dead, 100 million. It's like two, three New Yorks. So it's difficult to say. But tell me how that 100 million works. The, the, the total population of Israel is uh, something between 6, 7 million. How, how do you get 100 million? Yeah, Jay, so they, the, 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 the area that it was covering, uh, they estimated it to, uh, the Israeli um, uh, spokesperson has said that they wanted to target 100 million citizens. So that's the uh, statement that has come out. And uh, the retaliation will be such. So that's the way it works. Now, you say uh, uh, Israel will, will or should retaliate, I expect it will. Um, was Israel prepared for this attack? You know, the, I saw a piece in the paper that suggested that, in fact, um, the intelligence that there would be an attack came from the United States, which obviously had been watching this very carefully. They moved mm -hmm. troops and, uh, and ships into the area a few days ago. They knew something. Uh, they could figure out what was going to happen, um, and, um, and and they are, they are sharing. I believe they are sharing intelligence with Israel. So was Israel prepared? And how do you prepare for this kind of attack? It's very hard to uh, analyze this. Jay, how can you prepare for such an attack when you attack on seven fronts? For Israel, make it plus one and eight fronts with the domestic front also. How can you? call for, uh, you know, domestic elections and all this. So Israel, the state, was in a very precarious uh, situation for over a year. Now, uh, the U.S. ships which were in uh, the region have intercepted some of these missiles. The Iron Dome has been very vibrant and intercepted most of these missiles. Hardly any missiles have reached uh, the ground. And uh, Jay... Iran has been um, the audacity to say that they have informed the US and Russia of this retaliation before. 
So they have been blatant enough to say this. And can you imagine the US would have kept quiet if they knew about this attack? No, nobody would have. Uh, so they are like saying they have told the international community they are going to retaliate. That is no excuse for doing such an attack. It's a terror attack on a very big scale, Jay. It's nothing short of a terror attack. Because if they were attacking military to military, it was a different thing. If civilian areas are attacked, if you know their cities are attacked, it has to be taken as a terror attack. So the axis of uh, uh, evil, <laughs> the, 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 the demon, act demon actually has come out in the open. I read that uh, half of the weaponry, the ammunition, what have you, the missiles, um, the, the stockpiled missiles that Hezbollah has um, assembled, uh, that Iran has provided uh, in, in Lebanon, was destroyed uh, by the Israeli attack. Um, is Hezbollah still viable? Or did that destruction and the destruction of their command control systems um, make it impossible for them, them, Hezbollah, to continue to attack Israel from its side? They have been weakened uh, tremendously, Jay, with the line of uh, control completely eliminated and also uh, the stockpile of missiles being uh, destroyed. So these two factors made Hezbollah very weak and that is why Iran had to come in. Otherwise, they were very happy and jolly uh, putting Hezbollah through the uh, drill and making the missiles get fired through Lebanon. Now, when you're stopping Lebanon decisively, that is when Iran has no other option but to come into this war. And Jay, for Iran, I think they are uh, psychologically uh, so much into this war that they cannot stop, they cannot halt, they cannot pause. The moment they understood that Hezbollah is no longer functional, they have bought, in them, bought themselves directly into this uh, conflict, Jay. Otherwise, they were very happy with their proxies going on. And the Houthis, the Yemen uh, factor also uh, being brought in, you know, by Israel, uh, rein in by Israel was also one of the factors why Iran has come in. You know, uh, Rupmati, we can never overlook um, the phenomenon of, of a hybrid war and of propaganda. And, um, you know, I thought of the, uh, the war in uh, Gaza as soon as I saw the press reporting um, that women and children had been killed in Israel's bombing of, uh, of Lebanon. Um, now, of course, you have to see that sort of like what was happening in, in Gaza. Um, the, the government of Lebanon has been taken over by Hezbollah in the same way, thanks to Iran. And uh, all the people there are have been subjected um, to uh, Hezbollah. So the fact is that this is a, there is a certain similarity um, between you know the women and children aspect, the humanitarian aspect, if you will, uh, in Lebanon as as in uh, Gaza. But what was interesting is immediately uh, after the Israeli attack, we saw all this press uh, calling for humanitarian steps, and it. It, it sounded to me um, just the way October 7th and 8th was set up. Um, not only um, do you take kinetic steps on the ground, not only do you retaliate by missiles and the like, you also enter into the channels of propaganda as far as you can get. And so you have, you have news that suggests that uh, Israel is being terribly unkind. You have, uh, and wrong. Um, and you have news that um, suggests that a lot of countries that are friendly with Iran are condemning Israel for that. Um, and you and you have um, this ongoing, immediate and ongoing war propaganda. Do you, do you see it the same way? Yeah, Jay, and Israel has learned to uh, turn a deaf ear to that because unless do, they do self-defense at the highest level, nobody is going to give a heed to their worries. At all. The, this propaganda thing now, Jay, Israel has been living in a uh, existence of constant tension and, uh, you know, you don't know what happens next. So these bunkers are being built. The entire city can be taken underground. There's, uh, you know, you can protect your civilians. All this took place. Now, 
in the retaliation when there are bombs or uh, missiles being fired from israel to iran see the kind of media uh, coverage that will come in jail it will be absolute halabalu they will be crying on the streets that you know children and women and everything they will go for this whole saga again jail and that is what is disgusting about the media when they cannot uh, Uh, differentiate between what is right and what is wrong this is a retaliatory action of targeting the civilians and the uh, cities israel could not keep quiet now when it happens the retaliation happens it's going to be again mayhem what kind of retaliation do you think uh, israel will engage in i mean it has to, it has to be meaningful as you said and it has to be true iran as you said um what kind of options are open to it and um will this just um you know cycle up uh will this be um the widespread widening war that joe biden was concerned about uh how will this play out i i know that's a hard question but your thoughts on it they iran used the fahad missiles uh ballistic missiles on israel so they did not keep any steps and then they did not use drone they did not use drones they did not use small missiles so huge missiles were used now the israel uh, uh, retaliation has to be very decisive in what i say is that nuclear facilities of iran have to be targeted there is no other option below that it has to be destroyed because we know now in the future if they're using this mis- these missiles if they have the hands on a nuclear weapon they will put that to use and the uh, ali khamenei has been um, you know, very vocal about his intentions of he calls it the zionist regime he calls it as you know uh, he's very uh, there is a lot of uh, they they want to just destroy israel in plain simple words they don't have anything lesser than that there's no muted uh, expression of their talk it is always destroy destruct wipe out these are the terms that they use so the retaliation also has been very calm and not to be very extra provocative last time also you remember israel went in they could have targeted two uh, centers but they targeted one center as soon as they knew that they could uh, target him inside israel they came out the two fighter planes came out they did not do more action they just showed that they could come in they could target and come out so mm. uh, they have always kept their action limited but this time i feel j that this is the second attack that iran has attempted and failed at it but we cannot wait for a third one to happen you know a footnote to that that i saw in the press uh, a photograph of one of the iranian missiles and there were two israeli uh, people soldiers uh, one at one end of it and one at the other it was unexploded it had failed uh, that that missile had failed um and these guys were looking over it and that's right now today uh rupani i want to tell you um that this missile was like 40 feet long it was huge uh it had a diameter of like 6 or 7 feet this was a huge uh ammunition huge missile um and i i don't think we 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 have wrapped our minds around just how big these missiles are and how much damage they can do if they hit their targets that's what we have here and it, you can see it it's going to be in the press you will see more photographs of the unexploded missiles and it will be terrifying they do you always think of drones to be half a meter long a couple yeah. of feet we don't expect them to be 6 foot long uh, uh, missiles and drones and everything it's unbelievable jay what they've got them gotten themselves into and large scale manufacturing of this is what is the worry jay large scale manufacture they're literally uh, arming the russian uh, uh, army in the ukraine conflict with these shahid drones just drop and known as the suicide drones they drop and they explode so it's very convenient you have to just buy it from iran and iran jay is a very very uh, you you use the right word when you use rogue because they have bypassed 25 plus years of sanctions they have uh, they have kept them the domestic population muted they have been uh, supplying these proxies with everything that they need to hurt israel 
they have kept the war of uh, Islam versus Jews alive and uh, Jews and Christians very alive and very vibrant because they keep on calling the Islamic brethren. But uh, a couple of days back, you remember, uh, uh, Salman of uh, Saudi Arabia said, I don't take the Palestine issue personally. Countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Jordan have understood that they have spent enough of resources and mental strength on the Palestine-Israel issue. They have preferred to look into their own development and left this to the side. Now, who is left? Iran is left. Iran has got uh, money of oil and now these Shahid drones and ammunition supplied for other conflicts. So they are just, um, what do you say, pouring it into these proxies. And the proxies work 24-7 to attack Israel on seven plus fronts. Well, let's, uh, let's take a moment and look at Israel. Uh, you mentioned that morale was good. And um, and this is an existential threat. This is where they live. Um, this is their their country, uh, and it is being not only attacked but threatened with destruction. And more and more, you see that there, you know, Iran is not holding back. But but how is Israel doing in terms of um, you know this war of attrition, if you will, this war that ultimately gets to be an economic battle. Um, you know, if you have all those soldiers in the field, if you have um, all these efforts by the Israeli military to defend itself, uh, how can you have an economy? Any thoughts? The economy has taken a back back seat. You know, the soldier in Netanyahu is in the front. And uh, he has uh, he is playing his soldier role. If I, I'll, I'll send you a clip of uh, him being a soldier in his young days. He has been... Uh, he has just kept it focused to being uh, a soldier for Israel. And in the UN, he was so precise on what he wanted to say. He said this war will end now. Uh, Hamas should surrender, hostages should return. Two simple demands of the past and the war will end. But why does it not end? Because Hamas does not want to surrender and the hostages do not want to be given back. We had spoken about this, that hostages were being sold so that Israel can be blackmailed. So at one point, you have to choose sacrifice for a country. And that is what he is doing. If he doesn't sacrifice today, his country will stop existing tomorrow. So it's a hard decision for any leader to make. But he has to make it, Jay. Well, what about internal support? I mean, we know that thousands of people were in the streets over the past year demanding that he make peace on any terms. Um, which, you know, I really wonder about that, wh whether that would work, you know, um, surrendering essentially to Hamas, whether that would work to release the hostages and to avoid further uh, further war. Um, how about those people now? How about the people who would criticize him, call him out for corruption and things that they don't think are appropriate for the leader of Israel? Um, mm. I, you know, I wonder what kind of support do you think he's going to get going forward? Where, how will the right wing and the left wing in Israel, after all, it's a democracy, how will they, you know, react to this attack? Jay, all of them, right, left, and the middle, all of them were in bunkers today. All of them. And I, I hope they leave their political ideologies on a backseat because if they want Israel to really exist and survive this attack, they need to be united. And you put a united front behind your leader is the most important thing in today's world because the outside world does not support you. So if you don't have your internal support also, the it becomes very difficult. So internal support for your leader is very, very important. Now you take this, what is the leadership of Iran doing? Nothing. Uh, they have a, a religious leader who just talks nonsense about wiping off a, con a country off the map. Uh, there is supply of uh, domestic money which can be used for development to outside proxies to wage terror wars. The domestic population is not going up in arms against them. They support them. They, they are existing. They are surviving in, uh, even dominated, they are surviving in that regime. But Israel is being offered a democratic setup. There is, uh, there is a, a little bit of disturbance or there is, but it is being protected. He has, you know, what is commendable. Uh, 
the leadership under the leadership of netanyahu he has been able to protect hundreds and hundreds of millions of millions of civilians in this attack chain one ballistic missile can land anywhere and cause havoc 100 plus 120 plus ballistic missiles have entered israel not a single fatality reported so it's huge news that itself she commend him for what he has done rather than bring him down at this sensitive moment. afterward there is enough time to pull him out of office the united states has moved uh, ships and uh, personnel into the area it has uh, shared intelligence um how active has it been under the hood so to speak uh, how active will it need to be going forward because you know um you know you say that uh, iran would like to wipe israel off the map they also want to wipe the the us off the map they want to wipe the west off the map this is a clash of civilizations which they are dedicated to do and so um the us if it's in its you know if it's being rational it needs to deal with this and stop this uh however you do that so how how well do you think joe biden has done in recent days over this uh how well how much effort do you think and money and and military might do you think he has to put in uh going forward did you the ships were very instrumental in stopping the missiles which were fired in this attack it's a, the recent attack and joe biden has always you know given a little bit of restriction asked him to uh, exercise restraint try to keep the uh, retaliation muted but jay he has been an ally for israel because we know that since 19 uh, when he was a senate member he has been going to israel so he knows the issue in and out he is not uh, uh, the israel issue he knows it perfectly well jay because he's got experience in this issue he is not just a president who comes and he doesn't know ground reality so he has been following this but to make uh, merry to the media also he has to show that he is asking them to restrict but after the terror attack happened he has been uh, supplying the iron dome he has been helping israel as a true ally and that is very uh, you know, that is faithfulness and loyalty at its best jay because uh, joe biden uh, netanyahu is moving towards before january uh, he leaves the office he's trying to bring out these proxies he's trying to make decisive moves because he wants to do this under the leadership of joe biden that's what i feel uh, he's he's not waiting for somebody else to come into office he's trying to take maximum action under joe biden that's why the lebanese mm-hmm. ground attack was moving in a really good point uh, so what about kamala harris you know they both made statements joe biden has made statements about their reaction um and uh do you think that uh, Kamala Harris if she wins uh will will do the same or better or worse j little bit i have a issue with this because i like i told you joe biden has been visiting israel since he was a senate member 55 decades of experience in this israel issue kamala harris does not come in with that experience she will go with the Amer- american line of helping israel as an ally but that heartfelt connection will be missing there will be uh, you know there will be um, media pools or there will be senate member pools there will be palestine voices uh, and uh, pro palestine voices being heard there will be consideration of other issues here how it is there is unfiltered support for israel in joe biden's time and that is why i feel israel is taking maximum maximum decisions swiftly under this this can go on mm. for israel it's going on for decades but mm. right now yeah. with the, the technology improving and these missiles being um, provided and nuclear weapons being a possibility in the hands of iran israel has to act decisive and fast let's talk about uh, trump um you know he he has revealed himself as anti-semitic and he made some really crazy statements about how he holds the jewish community in the united states responsible um if he loses which is really looney tunes um and then you know i don't know if he's made any statements about this attack but i think he's he's been at first 
supportive of whatever not Netanyahu does, but more recently he hasn't been saying anything. And so it's questionable because you can't believe him, see? It's questionable what he would do, what he will do. Uh, if he if he prevails somehow, gets back into the Oval Office, um, will, will, will he do the same thing as uh, Joe Biden is doing? Will he protect Israel? Um, or will he um, will he do something that only plays to the advantage of his friend Vladimir Putin, for example? What do you think? Jay, Trump right now is in total election mode. So he doesn't want to even hurt a pro-Palestine voice or pro-Palestine vote. So he's being very uh, muted in his approach and in his statements. That's what is evident in what he does. But how he will help Israel is a possibility. How he will change in his policies from before to now is a possibility. So that kind of risk cannot be taken in this war at this stage because Israel has already finished one whole year of fighting with these uh, terror fronts. So to wait for Trump to come and take action, they want this, uh, un, um, what do you say, um, unblocked line continuity of aid that they get from uh, the US to continue without any uh, restrictions. It is this supply and this support. Jordan was one of the countries which came in. Uh, to stop these missiles. So all this is moving with very good precision. Jay. And uh, come, another leader in the office will take time to adjust, will take time to play to the galleries, uh, and uh, will not be that um, vocal in his support. So I feel that, that Joe Biden is ha having an edge over Trump and Kamala Harris and Trump, both are potential we don't know about in this, as regards this war, because Israel requires maximum support at this time. Any less will not work, because you see Iran is not only rogue, it is really evil. So it's not stopping at any point to hurt Israel. So that's why. So you talked about the gallery. This is my last question to you, Adi. Um The gallery is um, the American electorate, the American population, the American public opinion, the American you know, conversation. And of course, that includes, for better or worse, the media conversation. Um, and so we, right now, we we are in, in a kind of a, a, a lull in terms of media reaction. This is only happening like today. And within the next few days, we will see the media um, take positions on this, um, make opinions on it, um, report the news as they will, pro, con. Um, they'll be looking for news, as they always are. Uh, how are they going to go? How is the public going to go? I know this is also a hard question. Jay, uh, our public is not uh, very well educated. They're on the rim of the uh, fringe of the uh, news articles which come in. They just go the short-term memory uh, they have and they just think of oh Iran attack Israel they will forget this when Israel retaliates it will be called as Israel attacks Iran so it will be that it will not be like Iran has attacked Israel two times and failed but uh, there were attempt, attempts to hurt there were attempts to murder uh, people and uh, hurt people so that is kept in the background Jay. they mute this aspect and they highlight only the part that they like. So the pseudo-liberals, like we call it, they highlight only what they like. And they, the issues that they want to harp against are the ones that are highlighted, while the main historical facts are uh, kept to the side because they're not convenient for them to talk about. They are not convenient for them to look good upon. So they can, how many people will speak out for Israel against Palestine in this world? Very few. They will not be able to voice their opinion because they don't want to hurt the other person. But take a stand where it matters. Take a stand for the right. Take a stand for something that has happened. Do we have a UN condemnation on this? When the world body doesn't talk about this, how can we expect you know citizens to come about it? When it hurts you personally, then they will come for this. But till it comes to your doorstep, they are muted. 
so that is a cowardness in a personal opinions that comes forward they prefer to stay mute rather than speak out for the right you know you're talking about something that is happening while we're speaking this is indeed breaking news rupmati kandakar our geopolitical analyst reporting real time here on think tech aloha aloha ji thank you very much